Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking trade finance, the crucial lifeblood of the commodities sector. Liquidity shrank during the last decade as a result of legislation, scandals and ESG. And now in a time of higher interest rates, deglobalization and volatility, what is its future? Our guest is Christopher Tremaine. Chris started his career as an energy trader and now is the founder and CEO of Kimura an asset management business dedicated to the commodities sector. One of their key products is private credit trade finance, alongside futures trading and other investing. As always, you can really support the show by leaving a positive review on the platform you're listening on, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Chris, welcome to the show. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much. So we've returned to the subject of trade finance. The last time we covered it uh, in detail was a couple of years ago. And obviously, a lot has changed in the last year and a half or so, not least the complexities now around sanctions, issues of deglobalization, you know, increasing uh, use of the US dollar uh, in foreign policy. So all those pieces to tie together. But can we just start at the very basics, just so we, at least I'm on the same page? What do we mean by trade finance and the basics and and what are the basics of working capital when it applies to the commodities sector? The business of moving goods around the world takes time. So if you're producing goods on one side of the world and your buyer is on the other side of the world, it doesn't it takes a while for the goods to reach him once you've put it on uh, on a vessel and, and sent the goods. Now, the purpose of trade finance is to provide optimization for cash on balance sheets um, between those two counterparties and it's essentially just a bridge financing where obviously the seller wants guarantee that he's going to be paid when the goods leave him but the buyer doesn't want to pay for the goods until he's received them inspect them and they they are exactly what 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 was underlined in the contract. So the purpose of trade finance is to bridge that time value gap and create more efficiencies on the company's balance sheets. Cost of using your own cash in terms of equity is incredibly expensive, especially in today's world. So having uh, debt financing or tools like this is um, is incredibly useful for for corporates when they're trading physical goods. Yeah. And can you give us some sense of, I guess, firstly, how this is done? Is this typically trade by trade or, I mean, the large traders have big revolving credit facilities. Can you give us some sense of that? And then also the mechanics of of how the banks, I guess, collateralize that debt? Well, certainly we only have an hour today, I think. And your question (laughs) is probably several weeks of information. But um, yeah, if you start at the top of the credit stack, uh, your multinationals, AAA rated, down to sort of A rated counterparties, they are lucky enough to be afforded these unconstrained revolving credit facilities, where typically a bank would lead the tender, be the book leader of the tender, and then would syndicate with a number of other banks that wanted to wanted to join it. And that is a revolving credit facility, which is uh, essentially recourse to the very strong corporate credit worthy balance sheet. So that is the most flexible, the most uh, gives you the most scope as the recipient of that facility. And then as you move down the credit stack, things begin to change uh, quite dramatically. And in, indeed, why how our business came into existence in the first place was because of the way you have the impact of legislative changes on, your, on the bank's uh, exposures as you move down that credit stack. So you you move from these uh, unconstrained revolving credit facilities to things like borrowing based facilities where a larger trader doing multiple transactions would pledge collateral or cash to the facility. And it works like a master netting uh, agreement that you'd have in derivatives where you, you, you're paying the, the everything is offset and that you're financing the netted position. And then you move further down into uh, things like doing repo, where you would essentially buy the goods from the corporate and you would agree to sell them back on an agreed future date. So it's like an off balance, that's like an off balance sheet. It's a true sale. So so it's an off balance sheet financing structure that's pretty useful. Then we move down to secured transactional lending, 
and then it, static inventory finance the same sort of thing as a repo really but there's uh, there is there's hundreds of different ways that you can structure these uh, uh, particular lendings so there's there's a new structure for every type of uh, deal in every type of location yeah interesting and i guess the scale and you know uh, the oversight, as you say, gets gets more granular as you as you go down that that credit stack, which will probably play an important part later in the discussion. So if we go back, let you know, let's pick a a date in the last decade, or even before that. Can you give us some sense of who the traditional providers of credit to the the commodity sector from a trade finance perspective were, because that landscape has changed quite dramatically. So can you give us some sense of kind of you know who the traditional players were and then take us through what's really happened in the dynamics in that space well let's go back even further than that shall we i mean the providing or financing trade is probably the oldest form of banking you know there have been accounts of of this type of mechanism in ancient texts going back to babylonia so it's certainly nothing new and it was the cornerstone of most merchant banks for centuries. I mean, it was what the Medicis and the Brigenzas and uh, those banking dynasties were were founded upon. And certainly the, the the Dutch, the French, British trade banks. You know, it was it was the the cornerstone of these institutions. So up until the global financial crisis in two thousand eight two thousand nine, it was the captive of the banking community. There was no other competition. There were very few other specialized lenders. You might have seen some things like, I don't know, companies like Sten or London Forfeiting or something like that, maybe doing receivables. But essentially, it was it was the banks. And and the most uh, prolific financier, certainly in uh, on this side of the pond, was uh, Paribas or BMP Paribas. And they, at one time, I believe, was around about 20% of the global oil market in terms of their financings. So substantial uh, market share. Um, and that was a similar thing that we saw at um, you know, the Deutsches and the INGs and the Rabo banks and ABN AMRO and so on. And that is really where the, the market sat until the global financial crisis. What happened after 2008 and 2009 was we came up with um, some really poorly thought out pieces of legislation which dramatically changed the ways that banks could expose their balance sheets to corporates. And these things were like the Basel, Dodd-Frank, Volcker, et cetera, et cetera, Solvency II in regard to insurance companies. So the change in terms of the way that a bank could uh, expose themselves to a corporate you know, became night and day effectively. And that really changed risk weightings in terms of posting of tier two capital against exposures to corporates. And something that was non-investment grade, so just below triple B minus, anything below that kind of threshold, it got pretty aggressive. And you know, pre, pre-global financial crisis, you're talking about tier two capital weighting, I don't know, somewhere between 20 to 40% maybe, to now it's something crazy like 250 to 300%. So that piece of business for trade finance alone becomes no more really efficient or interesting to to banks on its own merits so the banks that were that still wanted to finance the smaller traders were really under pressure to cross sell across a whole myriad of their other products like debt capital markets foreign exchange wholesale banking so on they needed to ensure that there was a strong cross sell to justify so the upscaling of internal criteria for the banks, you know, really started from about 2009, 2010, which then uh, by doing that really opened up the market for other lenders to take advantage of, of that particular opportunity. And we saw a huge growth, not just in trade finance, but I mean, across every bank lending product like that, where we saw huge disintermediation with new specialized lenders coming in to deploy pools of capital that weren't didn't have exposure to these markets from pension funds, endowments, insurance companies, and so on, uh, that became very, very exciting for investors to now finally get a piece of this business that was wholly captive to investment banks for centuries. That's fascinating. Could you just, I guess, by way of an example, just help us understand 
how these, you know, whether it's Basel or whatever you said, how they actually made it unattractive or indeed impossible for banks to, to provide credit like what what was what were the actual mechanisms just as an example right so tier two capital is what you what you have to post up on the basis of the risk that you're undertaking uh, when it, when you're exposing your balance sheet as an investment bank and uh, the way the calculations were uh, were worked actually were worked in a zero interest rate environment at the time which is even scarier and that meant that businesses that sat in the credit stack that were non-investment grade got far harsher treatment on the requirements of the bank to post tier two capital against the exposure. So if I'm lending to a, a mid-sized trader who wants to borrow $25 million for a, for a small fuel cargo, the bank would have to post up, if it issued a documentary credit in favor of the, of the borrower, would have to post up in some cases, more than three times the value of that LC against the risk of being exposed to it. So that it, that then creates huge inefficiency for the cash at the investment bank. So there's there there are there are offsets and other other tools at the disposal of the bankers to lessen the impact. But you know, taking it as a direct exposure like that is uh, it, is is very very capital intensive, and that's something that they wanted to uh, obviate. Mm. Mm. And and there were other things going on at the time as well, right? Because not only were were there these new restrictions and policies and so forth. At the same time, we haven't even got to the sort of the ESG story here that further shrank the willingness of the traditional banks to deploy credit. There were also a number of scandals, particularly in Asia, uh, high profile events where there were losses and exposures as well. So, you know. At the same time as these new restrictions came in, there were these events. And also, frankly, you know, the commodity markets in the last decade weren't particularly volatile. So it's not like they were particularly lucrative trades either. So there's a lot of things coming together that were really squeezing the access to, to credit for the for the commodities sector. A, is that a fair statement? And B, before we talk about the rise of alternatives, what were the, the outcomes, what were the artifacts of that pullback that we could see in the commodity sector? How did it impact the commodity sector? Well, you know, testament to the size that the large traders have now become is, uh, is, is, is a telling sign to what happened because they had the ability to navigate the opportunity with the lack of liquidity that the smaller companies previously had. So the growth, really the failure of the smaller traders has been the success of the Traffies and the Vitals and the Glencores and Bungies of the world because the, the availability of liquidity just really crushed the little guy, if you like. So that is testament to the impact of the lessening of liquidity. When we, when we go back to those kind of that perfect storm scenario you mentioned with the, the high level sort of fraudulent transactions and blow ups that happened in Southeast Asia, a lot of these things happened because the specialization in the banks started to decline after the global financial crisis with the impact of these legislative measures, the shrinkage of trade finance at banks you know, became exasperated. So you're, you, you've got also the same problem that you've got diminishing skill set as well. So a lot of these frauds were, were uh, I mean, let's Hindley on the side, uh, were probably perpetrated due to lack of diligence. Right? The things like um, on-site checks in the uh, Qingdao warehouse in, in China, where there was uh, the, the trader taking multiple loans on the same metal and writing, you know, issuing his own warehouse receipts and things like that, which is like trade finance 101, a uh, red flag. So, you know, a lot of the diligence started to seep out with the diminishing departments. And so oversight started to change. And obviously that then triggered a whole a whole set of, events to try and make it a bit more secure, like having a digital documentary suppository in, in Asia and, and so uh, like a warranting system. So you can only finance one one material at one time. You can't have double finances on them and, and so on. So it definitely changed things out there uh, dramatically. But the, the, the change, 
it carried favour to the bigger merchants. Yeah. Um, so I don't think they're that disappointed that it really happened no. because they, they, they were able to seize a massive opportunity. But it, it is fascinating, isn't it? I, I do find this, when you step back and you look at the concentration of the sector over the last decade or so, you know, you've gone from a good 10, 12 medium-sized trading houses to now, pick your number, right, three or four or five behemoths, who have these huge, huge access to, to credit. The same has happened with obviously the banks themselves, apart from getting out of, of providing credit and trade finance, or some of them, you know, also got out of the actual the, the commodity trading piece as well. You've, same with energy merchants, you know, I mean, same across the board, whether it's metals, ags or oil, you've had this huge amount of consolidation. And it's, it's hard to figure out whether the fundamental reason for that is, as you've described, just the, the, the access to liquidity, the cost of business going dramatically up, or it's also at the same time you had other events such as, to use our, you know, the, the commodity super cycle phrase, you know, the, the, the trough of that. It's, it's hard to tease those apart, but it seems from what you're saying, you could argue quite vociferously that it was actually liquidity being pulled from the sector. Certainly, when the market calms down and investment starts to move out of it, liquidity uh, constraints on top, 14, 2014, 15, 16, you know, really, especially 15 was a really terrible year for the commodity market. The tide went out pretty aggressively and, you know, the, everything was predicated on this China growth story. Now we're seeing those kind of things slow down. But there's huge infrastructure products on the horizon and if you look at where we are in the commodity cycle right now you've had high you've got interest rates which have uh, dissuaded uh, people to store commodities large inventory at the front end of the market you've also got storage dynamics which haven't um, you know across the forward curve that haven't been overly supportive of doing that as well certainly because of the the pandemic and a number of other issues there has been very little investment into expanding uh, the upstream supply chain you've got a you've got a stock market that is incredibly overbought right now and you've got the dollar which in my opinion is incredibly uh, incredibly shaky and you're in a situation where there seems to be substantial elasticity in some of the underlying commodities for, i mean i think cocoa was what 130 percent up on, uh, this year it's obviously come off the highs recently, but um, you know it, it would need to be the, effectively the same price as gold before it would actually impact demand. So that's an environment which, where everyone's short vol as well, that it looks particularly interesting for people to now to start come in and in terms of just the price action of the underlying alone to stimulate some more investment. So you've got commodities rallying as they are. You've also got U.S. consumer uh, debt delinquencies at the highest level since 2010 without a recession, without a market crash. So these kind of things do worry me a lot. Um, so I think we're going to see some very aggressive increases in commodity prices, uh, potentially. Certainly a, a big increase in volatility over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. You've got an election year as well in the U.S., and guess what happens when the price of commodities goes up? You know, liquidity gets starved further. Mm. So available liquidity is only there to provide at the, the current prices. Um, so if we see this this whole complex strongly rallying, that's going to exasperate that even further. Yeah. Well, you and I are, are headed to the FT's Commodity Summit next week, and uh, just to date the episode. And uh, yeah, we'll see what prognostications are made because. Um, Similar views were, were given last year, none of which materialised, right? So it's, it is, one thing is for certain, it's a volatile world and uh, unpredictability has gone up. If you, wait, if you wait long enough, you're always going to be right. <laughs> <laughs> the HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content 
for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Just staying on that higher interest rates and, and tying that into this rise of the alternative lenders. So, you know, I, I guess firstly, let's talk about who were the alternatives that came in to disintermediate the traditional role of the banks. And I assume they were doing that at a premium to what traders were previously paying uh, the, the traditional providers. Yeah, there, there's there's a few different perspectives on it. I mean, there's there's funds that came in and did effectively bank capital relief. And, you know, going back to my earlier point, when I said that tier two capital waiting for a bank that's financing something that's non-investment grade is a many multiple of the actual exposure. So uh, the banks utilize external capital from funds who are doing sort of capital relief lending directly into the bank. So they're they're lending to a bank as instead of to an individual borrower. So there was quite there's, there's there were quite a few businesses that um, did that very very well. Um, uh, notably, James Parsons, who's now at Pack Capital, but um, you know created a very successful business doing that at Bluecrest. And then you had a number of other companies that came in to set up you know inverted commas funds. So we had companies like Barack, EFA. Transasia, uh, I mean, even Green, Greensill, that were there to provide uh, working capital finance to corporates. And it was, they were able to price themselves slightly higher than the banks with more certainty to be able to deploy capital to their borrowers. So, uh, and also the turnaround time um, in smaller organizations in these, in these smaller funds was attractive to to corporates as well because bureaucracy in in banks takes a very very long time to actually process onboard a client and then go through the process of uh, doing the credit review the assessment and then the setting up of the facility and deploying it this is not a this is a nine to twelve month uh, time horizon sometimes longer so the the funds came in and were, were able to win a lot of business and price it slightly higher than than banks purely for you know for being fleet of foot and have more certainty to deploy the capital and that came in you saw a wave of these these managers come in from about 2010 onwards and most of the most of the uh, lenders uh, i mean including us at the beginning were, were focused on the the sme market but that has uh, has some attractiveness but also a lot of pitfalls at the same time and I think now with where you've seen a lot more consolidation, certainly there's not that many uh, attractive SMEs that we'd, we'd want to we'd want to lend to now. Um, you have to do the same amount of work on a hundred thousand dollar loan as you do on a hundred million dollar loan. So with interest rising as they are, it's the mid to the large cap space is 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 imminently eminently more attractive. Twenty twenty and the credit headwinds that that came with that showed. There were a number of bad actors in the space. They were accruing interest on facilities that haven't reconciled. And quite a few of them uh, were unable to meet redemption demands and actually ended up going out of business, which was a, which was a shame, even the mighty Greensill. So it's, it's not for the faint hearted. Well, Greensill's a, a, a different podcast entirely, isn't it? <laughs> one, one to come back to. Okay. And then, and then since, I guess, the pandemic, you've had the further challenges, of course, higher interest rates, which, you know, and again, I always think about this, actually, they've just returned to historic normals rather than being high, right? I mean, we're just talking about 5%, which is historically the average of, 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 uh, of the cost of capital. You've also layered in now in a much more complex world when it relates to sanctions and you know, in the in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, can you give us some sense of the seismic impact that has been, and I guess the the challenges that all participants face in making sure that they're not get you know unduly exposed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the whole Western world is effectively shut out of of anything in uh, uh, relating to Russia. You have to be incredibly careful that you have traceability on or origin on a lot of these products, and that's something that um, you know we spend a lot of a uh, lot of time, energy, and money uh, ensuring that we're not on the wrong side of something like that. 
it's taken a large segment out of the market. But again, as I, it's created opportunities for those that, that can trade, that have the author, uh, authorization to do some of those those deals. You know, dealing in being denominated in U.S. dollars with U.S. investors, it's not something that we can even cons- we could even fathom. So um, that has been very interesting with the with the growth of intensity on on sanctions. But I mean, after the, after the global, they, these things tend to come in these these kind of fat. I hate to use the word fad, but these fad type waves where after the financial crisis, it was all compliance people that institutions were hiring. And then a few years ago, it was the it was the sustainability, responsible investing, ESG boom, which on the whole conceptually is a great thing. But in practice, um, again, you know, like most of these uh, bank legislations, you know, pretty poorly thought out. So uh, with, with with the um, let's just touch on ESG a little bit because the banks, the irony of it is, is we've seen agricultural traders who are less financially robust and less sophisticated than than clients in energy and metals um, actually you know move away from alternative lenders because the banks are opening up uh, and, and more willing to finance agricultural trading companies on ESG grounds. So they they seem to have pretty pretty substantial coverage now back back at the banks, whereas a far more financially robust, socially responsible, very well run corporate energy businesses are really struggling for liquidity. So there seems to be a lot of hypocrisy in terms of the policies themselves. What is a good risk versus a, a bad risk? I tend to think in terms of ESG, if you're not polluting the oceans or you're not wantingly destroying habitat, there needs to be some common sensing around what products you're providing for the for the betterment of society. We've covered this a fair bit, right? We even had an episode with Guillaume Petron on his book, The Dark Cloud, you know, where he essentially points out that actually, if you want to look at the some of the, the biggest consumers of energy, consumers of materials, you know, and, and really causing an impact on the planet... You know, it's these large tech companies, right? And actually, if you want to solve the energy transition, you need to make sure that the energy companies are profitable and able to invest to do so. So, yeah, I I, I agree. And I think we are we are now in ESG 2.0, you know, compared to sort of the perhaps the 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 less thought out thinking, you know, mid mid pandemic. But the the whilst you know these things do come in waves right and cer- certainly there's there's fads to investor sentiment the problem with the the sanction environment at the moment is you know a, a, a false step intentional or not has incredible ramifications right um for organizations absolutely and um you know Venez- with venezuela being briefly open for business in terms of oil exports but we we'll see where we are in two weeks' time, on when when the review is, I think it's the eighteenth of April, but there's been a, a you know an enormous flurry of traders getting in there to uh, export cargoes from from Venezuela, and then things like having retrospective impact on sanctions if they close the doors is not overly helpful for the market. But we can understand uh, why the US would, uh, would would take that line or take that perspective in in enforcing these kind of things, and let's not forget. It was the demise of BNP Paribas. Uh, their trade finance division were cited for sanctions breaches and uh, fined a, a, an enormous number. I think it was over nine billion dollars, and it caused the you know the most uh, prolific financier in in the market to have to shut down operations. Yeah. I do. I mean, anecdotally, or from my discussions, I think obviously those banks that have stayed in are actually doing extremely well, you know, in terms of performance, because obviously it is a more consolidated uh, competition uh, landscape out there. The other the other interesting conversation I had uh, it was that there seems to almost be, you know, a double standard when it comes to the commodities sector, where an event, you know, a fine or whatever it might be, has an outsized impact on on the banks and their willingness to lend compared to the sort of the daily fines we hear 
Apple and Google getting slapped with over anti-competitive behavior or whatever it might be, right? It's it sort of, they're still fine to lend to, whereas actually there's something about the commodities sector that even the smallest issue seems to have an outsized impact on the risk um, liquidity providers are willing to take. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, the story of the you know my 27-year career. It's always been uh, commodities bad, technology good. The trouble we had uh, when we started this business just to get a checking account open because we had the word commodity attached to our our business you know every every retail bank that that we went to see you know the perspective on it was we were financing involved in the financing of terrorism and and bad things and oil spills and all this kind of stuff it's just you know it, it 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 is a very very sensitive thing portrayed as I suppose the villain of the piece, because it is often uh, the financial power of developing economies. So to vilify the one thing that they that they have a leverage on is, it, it, I'm sure it suits some agendas somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's amazing how um, the lack of engagement from you know all of this plethora of, of policies coming out about the energy transition there always seems to be a lack of engagement with the actual commodity trading community who are essentially the ones that are going to solve these problems by efficient capital allocation, you know, and moving these products around the world, right? I mean, it's... Um... Well, I mean, look, let's face it. If uh, with this uh, energy transition and climate action, etc., there are two nations on planet Earth that, it act, that actually need to get on board with it, and that's China and India. And if neither of those nations decide that they're ready for the energy transition, the effectiveness of everything else that we're, that we're doing makes very, very little impact with the main focus, inverted commas, to be around slowing climate change. Now, I'm not going to give you my opinion on, on that because, it's, it's again, it's probably something for another time. But, I mean, nations like Japan have very quietly converted 14 of their cogen power stations to receive coal and they have made substantial investments in uh, indonesian mining properties for the supply of that coal now their the sophistication on their power stations actually uh, because of the very complex exhaust treatment that they have don't actually emit any co2 into the into the air at all and they've done that for the for their energy security going forward, and they will continue. Obviously, the disasters of Fukushima and so 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 on. They're not going to get. They see they're not going to get what they want from the renewable segment, and um, are making the right decisions for their their country and their society. Okay, right. Just one comment on talent because um, you mentioned it earlier. So. Is it fair to say, and I guess we have certainly seen this, that the, you know, you've had this hollowing out of trade finance skill sets as that market consolidated in the wake of the global financial crisis. But now we're back in a stage where, you know, all this is this is mission critical for all organizations in a higher interest rate environment, you know, with a lot of these challenges around the how, the where, the who's financing. It seems to me that that, you know, we've seen a, a big increase in demand in more sophisticated trade finance types in-house and within the banks themselves right as this as this has come roaring back there are there are things like the trade finance distribution initiative which is trying to bring in more capital uh, to the space but, but you know one of the challenges when you're trying to get institutional investors in there and there's a huge amount of dry powder out there um, that this type of product is it, it becomes slightly complex for the investor to understand what what it actually is how do i settle it what's the icing uh, you know the, when you're talking about capital markets investors asking them to provide finance so you can go provide investments so you can go finance a bunch of commodity trades this is something that is a a little bit backward to them so there are as i, as I mentioned the, the initiatives out there to to create structures to allow investment to come in to things that look a lot more like a capital markets product, like a, a note or, or a securitization or something that they can create a credit rating on or an insurer can wrap it. And then it's far easier to get those things placed in, in the market than saying, hey, look, we can expose you to trade finance 
So there, there needs to be much more growth there. I think you know the relationship between banks and alternate lenders needs to needs to be better. That relationship needs to be symbiotic as opposed to a kind of us and them type scenario. Where uh, alternate lenders are f- effectively picking up the business that the banks can't do anymore or don't necessarily want to do anymore. So there's a, there's a, there's a good case for cohabitation to solve a lot of these problems. So the digitization of of the underlying trades, the creation of investor products that that is more familiar to traditional uh, capital markets investors um, outside of offering someone a, an open or closed ended fund uh, commingled fund vehicle. We're getting there. We're, we're, I think we're getting there. Uh, we've overcome a lot of the challenges that the, that the markets presented us in terms of trying to translate the complexities of uh, tr- commodity trade finance to something that's palatable and easy to understand by an investor. Great. I mean, um, before we just talk a moment about Kimura itself, when you look toward the future, uh, you know, we already mentioned how, how clouded the crystal ball is. You know, what what are the major trends in this space in trade finance that you think we should keep an eye out for? Well, no one's really solved the digitization uh, of of creating the security of the underlying trades. A lot of people have kind of come up and tried to offer a digital experience to participants in the market. I think probably the one who's got a lot of traction, but it's more a workflow tool, is, is Comgo, where they effectively consolidated all of the Rather than having to have 50 bank dongles and a million logins, everything's nicely set up through one portal, allows seamless communication with, with, with the financing banks. So that's been, that's been a, a good thing to see. But again, that's only serving, really serving the banking community. Everything needs to come together as one here with alternate lenders, private equity firms, insurance companies, etc. So there's a huge amount of dry powder out there. I think uh, the big American private equity shops, mm. Carlyle, Blackstone, KKR, all of these guys have recently raised capital for their private, the new private credit vehicles, which is in the magnitude of up to fifty billion dollars in each one of them. Um, so there's a there's a huge amount of liquidity there, which you know, if offered in the right way, to allow that kind of capital to come into the market, that's what we're trying to solve for. Yeah, on the on that digitization piece, one of the challenges is actually these consortiums are very hard to put together because typically commodity traders don't want to trust each other, especially not with their data, right? So those are those are challenging. The other just piece is, you know, we're kind of having this bifurcation of the market as we alluded to earlier on. Are we going to end up with two pretty separate ecosystems, and you cannot be a participant in both? You know, sort of the West and the East, so to speak. That could well happen. I mean, look, if we look at the uh, ground that the, the BRICS uh, consortium of countries is is really quite impressive traction that they are beginning to build. And that ecosystem could quite easily operate without the other one. You, you do obviously have members within the BRICS consortium that can straddle both sides. But will that mean that uh, the US wants to sanction India, I don't know. I doubt it. But, um, you know, we could live in a world like that. I don't think it I don't think that that really suits the greater political agendas. But it is a possibility. Yeah, I mean, it would certainly decrease flexibility and increase costs, right? Well, give us a, give us a couple of minutes on Kimura. And then uh, I mentioned that the, in the intro, your podcast as well. But can you just give us a, a, a couple of lines on Kimura? Sure. Uh, we're an asset management firm that is only focused on commodities. Uh, we have our, our our main product is is private credit and commodity trade finance, but we also have private equity strategy and junior mining. We have an Africa impact strategy focused on uh, financing trade, and we launch a macro managed futures strategy this summer with some fine people who were formerly at Traffic Europe. So we are. Our goal is to not be the the leading alternate lender in the commodity markets worldwide, but we're adding what would I suppose, if you if you looked at it retrospectively, resemble the services that a merchant bank would would have traditionally provided the market with. 
So that's uh, liquidity, that's uh, um, hedging, pricing, financing needs, uh, both in CapEx and OpEx. And we are a business that has a very high degree of expertise and specialization in the underlying market. We're made up of people who came from uh, Goldman's, from Traffic Bureau, from Hartree Partners, uh, from Glencore. And uh, that's sort of a, a similar theme, theme that runs through the entire company. It's also, you know, the love of my life, I suppose. It hasn't been a particularly easy journey, but it's certainly one that's given us a lot of experience. And we, I believe we're now at a point where the brand and the company has proven to itself uh, and the market that we, that we deserve to be here. So it's, 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 been a, it's been a very interesting journey so far, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what is up on the horizon. Fantastic. Well, it's certainly been a really enjoyable discussion. I'll put links to uh, to Kimura in the show notes, as well as your 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 the podcast stable that uh, you have as an as an investor, rivaling Goalhanger Podcast. For those who know what that is, but um, <laughs> you know, look forward to having you back on in a year or so and see where we stand. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.